This is Stanley Sism coming to you with the class for Sism Christian University in Pauline Epistles 1, which includes the Pauline, Pauline letters of Romans and Galatians. Now, Paul's letters to Galatia and to Rome cover some of the same subject matter. Galatians is the more immediate response to a situation, and Romans is the longer term more fully considered, more thorough exposition on the subject. And this subject is explicit in the title of the text to the book, which is By Grace Through Faith. Paul's authorship of both of these letters, Galatians and Romans, is not seriously questioned except during the mid-19th mid century uh, fad by a few scholars at that time. And each of these letters will have its own introduction and in the text, there is a book related to each of the two texts, uh, uh, two letters. Book 1, Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 1 of the book says that the author is Paul. By the way, as in almost all books of the Bible except Psalms, the chapter divisions are not part of the original uh, text, nor of course, are the verse divisions. These are just a convenient screen placed over it in order to help us find different passages. Some of these chapter divisions and verse divisions were made very well, and some were not made so well. It's just important to realize they're not part of the original text. They're just a way of mode of reference to find things. Now, the recipients of the letter are, it is says in the second verse, Galatia. This word occurs three times in the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1, it refers to Northern Asia Minor, and that is the original meaning of the word. It was a Hellenistic kingdom occupied by Gauls. When Alexander the Great conquered Persia, then a that allowed Greek uh, uh, migration to come into uh, Asia Minor. Now, uh, what we call Asia Minor, minor meaning little, was little Asia was the appendage to the vast continent of Asia, and so that was a good name for for Turkey, what we now call Turkey, the land which the Turks uh, uh, invaded, occupied, and ruled. But the, um, at that time, Asia Minor was, uh, was a good name taken from the Mediterranean perspective. This area was occupied, uh, inhabited uh, by the Celts, by Gauls, moving in during the 3rd century BC. In 25 BC, the Roman province of Galatia, by then, of course, the Hellenistic kingdom uh, descended from Alexander's time is gone, and the Romans have conquered over the area, and they named the place Galatia, the place where the Gauls live, and they founded it there, but then in 25 BC they expanded it southward to the area which Paul and Barnabas later visited on their first missionary journey. That is in the book of Acts in the Bible. Chapters 13 and 14 describes their trip. So you have two different areas called Gaul, northern original Gaul, uh, sorry, called Galatia, northern original Galatia, the area where the Gauls lived, which was um, around what the city of Ankara, which is now modern Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey, and then the later southern Galatia, which is where Paul and Barnabas first came. And the reason they first came there is very simple. They had started their, their missionary trip from Cyprus, which is where uh, Barnabas was from, and he was uh, apparently the leader of the trip at the beginning. You see his name is listed first it, Barnabas and Saul at the beginning, but then later, uh, as time goes by, Saul is, begins to be called Paul because Saul is a Jewish name and now they're reaching uh, 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 Gentiles and to whom that name means nothing and they, he takes on a name that 
Paul that sounds similar. And there's a, this kind of thing is done many, many times. In fact, the immigration to the area was, is, is also the kind of thing that is done many, many times. And uh, whenever a better life is available in another area, and, uh, and people often move there to improve their life, as the Gauls did this time. And when people move to a new area and they want need to be able to communicate with the people from that area, they often uh, take on a name that is similar. Uh, there are people, uh, Chinese people who moved to uh, South America and whose name was Juan, W-O-N in English, but he called himself Juan. There are people from India who have come to the USA and who may be named Deva, and they took the name Dave or David uh, when they came into the Western culture. So that this kind of adjustment of your name to fit the place that you have now moved to and are, are focusing on is that something that happens many, many times. And Paul did that. Now, from these two different views of what is meant by Galatia come two main views on the recipients of this letter. The older view, which is based on the northern central Gaul, Galatia, Asia Minor, is that because that's where the Gauls settled when they invaded, it's, they say that the people who believe this view say that Paul didn't go there in his first missionary visit, but he did in the second because there is a statement in Acts 16 verse 6 that says that Paul went throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So that includes that. And uh, the, that reference to where Paul went in the second missionary vision, uh, journey, he does mention that he also went to Lystra, which of course was part of his uh, goal because he said that he was going to uh, visit the churches that, that, had, uh, that they had started on their first trip. Now that we know Paul went to the second, to the south on the first trip, but the people, the second view says that Paul is writing to the churches that he founded on that first trip. Now, if the first view is correct, then Paul would have to write this in terms of the date of the writing of this letter. He would have to write it no earlier than 50 AD, which is when, uh, when he made the second trip. So if the first view that it is uh, Northern Galatia that is being referenced, is correct, then Paul would have to write that no earlier than 50 AD, and maybe 53, 54, 55, 6, 57, somewhere in there. And most likely he would have written, if he wrote it then, from Ephesus, because he was there for uh, three years during that time, as is mentioned in Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 20, verse 31. If the second view is correct, then Paul would have had to have written this letter dur uh, in Antioch during 48-49 after his first uh, journey and before the council in Jerusalem. The, now, uh, which, which of these is correct? Uh, it is my own view that the first view is correct and that he's written, writing it to the northern part, and why do I feel that way? I feel that way because this letter is more theologically developed than First and Second Thessalonians are. It looks like it's a later letter than those two, and consequently those two would be the first letters written by Paul. Also, this letter has close theological uh, thematic uh, ties to Romans, and we do know that he wrote Romans during that later period of time. So I think this letter is written later, and that first Paul writes Galatians angrily regard because of a local situation that he's facing in Asia Minor, and uh, he is writing that fiercely at that time. And then, because he is contemplating going to Rome, where he has never been, he is introducing himself to the church there 
and presenting the gospel dealing with many of the same themes but in a more fully uh, developed more fully expository way and a less polemic way because he doesn't he's not facing an individual situation there he's dealing actually with a church that he knows a number of the people in but does not know the church itself and did not found the church itself has not been there before so um, what is the purpose of the letter these people whom uh, in Galatia who he has been reaching out to uh, are pagan background people they are uh, an illustration of that would be the, uh, the town where Paul went and they they because somebody was healed uh, the pagans decided that he was he and Barnabas were gods come down and started to worship them and this kind of thing of the God man is of course very familiar to those of us who have worked in places where there is a polytheism today such as in India and Nepal and uh, so because these people have come from a non-Jewish background, it is interesting to see the different way that Paul proclaims good news to them than he does when he's talking to Jews. When he talks to Jews in Acts 13 in the synagogue, he talks about the great heroes of the Jewish faith, Abraham, Moses, David. When he talks to the Gentiles and uh, the, the pagan background people in Acts 14, he doesn't say anything about any of those because they would not know about any of those people. Who's Abraham? Who's Moses? Who's David? Instead, he talks starting at creation and, and discusses from that point onward that the creator who made everything that we see around us has now um, come down to save us. And that is the good news. So, uh, when he writes to these people who have come to Jesus Christ straight from paganism, then, and he, he, has, he has then come back to, to Antioch, he has then gone to the, to the conference in Jerusalem, giving his report there, and because the conflict has come up as to when people come from paganism to Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the Messiah, uh, then do they need to join Jerusalem, to join Judaism as part of their coming to Jesus Christ? Now, this is a central question that is often faced by many people. If you are going, for example, to tell a Roman Catholic about the good news of grace in Jesus Christ, and you want to come to them, do they have to be dragged through the Reformation? Do you have to persuade them that Martin Luther is a good guy in order to bring them to Jesus Christ? The answer is no, because see, Martin Luther has his faults as well, as they have probably already been informed by, by their uh, Catholic priests. Martin Luther had a hot temper. Martin Luther, when his advice was rejected by the peasants, uh, and Martin Luther did have good advice. Uh, he told the peasants that there is no rule that has not been established by God. That was a quote from Romans chapter 13. So Martin Luther was telling the peasants the truth. The peasants, however, had been oppressed by the aristocracy, by the nobility for so long, and they were fed up, and they rejected Martin Luther's advice. And so Martin Luther was hurt and angry that, his, that he had been rejected. And so in a fury, he wrote that the nobility had uh, had the right to destroy, to kill, to break, to plunder, to loot, to burn uh, the revolt, the peasants' revolt, and it, in the end, that's what happened. So they, they, the 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 the, 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 the aristocracy did do that, and uh, uh, Luther's advice had been good, but. Uh, his attitude after having been rejected. See, so um, when we drag somebody through someone else to bring them to Jesus Christ, you have to be a good Protestant in order to be a good Christian. No, you have to just come to Jesus Christ. So there, there are these issues that the Gentiles of Paul's time, do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. Now, 
the Jews, the church was almost 100% Jews, and the Jews felt that circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and so on was normative. This was uh, this was what everybody does. This is what the faith does. And uh, James, when he gives his uh, his uh, decree at the end of the council in Jerusalem, says uh, that uh, everybody can can follow these particular rules and they can know what they are because he says the law the, 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 is, is spoken in the synagogues everywhere see the presumption is that the Jews are the, the Gentile Christians are going to go to the synagogue and the problem at the synagogues is of course that the majority of the Jews are not accepting Jesus as Messiah and the synagogues are kicking people out for accepting Jesus as the Messiah and so uh, to say that they can depend on the synagogues to teach them the right way to live is going to be a problem and um, uh, so that's the council can give its instructions but the further instructions in day-to-day -day living are going to have to come from the apostles letters and visits that uh, by the apostles themselves and the people they send and uh, and uh, that's going to have to develop that way through the house churches rather than by depending on the synagogues so to, you can see that it was normative now the lesson of all of this is very obviously applicable today uh, missionaries can go out from their home country and that originally it tended to be Britain then in the 20th century it tended to be America and uh, as time goes by now there are missionaries going out from uh, so many other nations there are missionaries going out from South Korea there are missionaries going out from the Philippines there are missionaries going out from Nigeria there are missionaries going out from from South America so so uh, there are uh, when a missionary leaves his home area and goes to another place, there are certain worship styles, there are certain uh, practices that he just thinks, he or she just thinks is, is part of the faith and takes for granted. And, but they are not taken for granted by the people in that new place, in that new mission area that they go to. And so uh, those people are going to ask, why are we doing this? Where is it in the scripture? And then the person who has taken it for granted, assumed that it is to be done, is going to have a, perhaps a hard time defending some of those things. And may come, depending on his own attitude, he may come to an understanding that he does not have a defense for some of the things that he has just assumed are part of the faith. And instead, he may have to drop some of those things because they're not required by the scriptural text. And uh, so this is a problem we face today and the ministers face today the same situation and uh, you can you can attend international meetings overseas if, if those meetings are majority North Americans attending those meetings then you will see a worship style that is done such as a retreat or a, some conference attended heavily by North Americans, you will see the worship style done in the way that they find familiar, not in the way that the uh, people to whom they are supposedly reaching out find familiar. And so it becomes amusing to go to the other side of the world and find that they're doing things exactly the same way that was done in America, not because the scripture required it, but simply because of the cultural conformity practiced by uh, the, the people who were sent out from their own country. Now, as Paul has a, a Christianity started, of course, among the Jews in chapters 2 through 7 of Acts and it spread to international Jews in chapters 6 through 9. You can see the Hellenistic Jews, the, the Greek-speaking Jews. You can see parallels of that today. There are, for example, in, uh, in India, there are people who wear traditional clothing of India, the, the, the juba or the lungi in the south, dhoti in the south, uh, maybe the, the salwar kameez, saris, uh, kurta pajama in the north, and then there are other people who wear international clothing, They're regular shirts, trousers, dresses, things like that. So the person who 
is not following their traditional customs can be looked on by the others as being uh, untrue to their culture and uh, doing something that is uh, immoral even though there may not be any mor morality connected with that act but doing something that is anyway untrue to their traditions and so this division took place in the early church between the traditional Jews and you can even detect some of this in terms of the names they give their children James and John, for example, come from a traditional, and so does Jesus, a traditional family. Look at the names of Jesus' brothers, look at the names of John, Johann, Jacob, these are very, but Peter and Andrew, that's a family that is taking more Hellenistic style. These are, uh, uh, Andrew is a, is a Greek name, and uh, so you have, um, you have this right from the start, and then uh, it begins to build in Acts chapter 6 because the minority, the Hellenistic Jews, are being discriminated against. How many times have we seen this kind of thing through the history where a minority is discriminated against? So the minority is being discriminated against. But the church took an excellent attitude about this. And the social program which was reaching out to this, these people, they... Um, the social program that was reaching out to these people, they put that program in the hands of the people who had been discriminated against. The seven deacons who are named in Acts 6 all have Greek names. So the minority that had been discriminated against becomes in charge of the social program, the so social program of, of, of relief for the, for the widows. So they were reaching out to other cultural practices already, and then they began to reach out to the Gentiles. But when Peter did that in Acts chapter 10, he faced backlash when he got back to Jerusalem by people saying, you went to a Gentile's house, uh, so you, you disobeyed the law, you, disobeyed, you went to a Gentile's house. And see, a number of these laws were not in the scriptural text. They were interpretations layered on top the, uh, of the scriptural text by interpretation. People saying that the text says this, and therefore it means that. And then you would have to go back to the original text and say, no, it doesn't either mean that. That's not what it says. It just says this. And you are putting a spin or an interpretation on it, which the text itself doesn't contain. So this was already going on in the early church. Now, as Paul began to travel to these different places, as we have seen in Acts 13 and 14, the Judaizers followed him to some of these churches. He couldn't be everywhere at once, and so he would be elsewhere than Judaizers from the home church would come follow up and visit these churches and then they would say they would demand conformity to the Old Testament law and um, now if th there was any conflict if anybody would question why are you telling us that we have to do this uh, Paul didn't say this some of them were saying that Paul wasn't a real Apostle. He had not been with Jesus Christ, and real apostles had to have been. Uh, 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 they had to have been with Jesus from the beginning, and so these visitors said that we represent the original, the true, the, the original church. Paul, on the other hand, is not a real apostle. He's a compromiser. He's watering down the faith. He's not telling you about this stuff just in order to uh, make it easier for you to, to come in. So, um, this, all of this we find familiar today because similar things happen now. Since, uh, but uh, the big question is, of course, how much of the Jewish law applies to, to Christians now? So, some of these Jewish Christians still believing that the Jewish ceremonial practices were binding on the New Testament church. They insisted that the Jewish, that the Gentile believers abide by these, including circumcision. Now, what is the, the circumcision had been 
a practice among different Semitic tribes, not just Abraham's family, but before Abraham. It had been practiced way back. Uh, it had been an identifying mark between the, Sem the Semitic and the non-Semitic people, even back in, uh, in uh, Babylon area, in the, in the Mesopotamian area. So, but just like the, the rainbow existed, but then was made a symbol of God's covenant with Noah in that same way. Circumcision, which already existed, was made a symbol of God's covenant with Abraham. And so that covenant existed uh, already, and so the, and then had been incorporated into Moses' law. And so now uh, the... Uh, the uh, but even in Moses' time, it wasn't always practiced. For example, uh, it was instituted, but it was not practiced. And then when they were coming up on the border of, of uh, Canaan and about to conquer, they had to stop and circumcise the, the new generation because the old generation had to come out of Egypt. They had been circumcised, but the new generation that was now entering Canaan after being spending all these years in the wilderness, had not been circumcised, new babies born and everything. So they had to do that first. See, that shows they had not been doing it consistently all the way along. So the Jews had already experienced the difficulty of keeping track of all the laws and following them all. And uh, now they are insisting that the Gentiles practice circumcision. And uh, the Judaizers are saying that Paul isn't an authentic apostle, and he's uh, he's deleted some legal requirements just to make it easier for them, and to to uh, and they would accuse him of compromising and watering down the faith. Paul replies by sub by substantiating his apostleship and also his message. In the first two chapters of Galatians, he spends quite a bit of time doing this. He says that the Judaizers are introducing additional requirements for justification, and by doing that, they are perverting the gospel, the good news of grace through faith, and that by faith and by the Spirit, we live. Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. This new free life that we live in the Holy Spirit, they're perverting that, the Judaizers are, by saying that their salvation is based not just on Jesus dying on the cross, but on, circum uh, uh, on circumcision and other facets of the Old Testament law that you must obey in order to be saved, in order to belong to the, to the covenant people. So Paul says, if, if, if you can save yourself by obeying the law, then a savior is not necessary, and that means that Jesus Christ died in vain. And if you do try to live by the Old Testament law, and uh, you call you cut yourself in circumcision, you are cutting yourself off from Jesus Christ. And he says that uh, explicitly, just like that, in the text. And of course, as he says. That is not good news at all, chapter 1, verse 7. So as we begin this class, please read, first of all, Acts chapters 13 and 14, before you go to the next uh, uh, lecture, read Acts chapters 13 and 14, and consult a Bible map, you should probably find it in the back of your map, a Bible to see where Paul went. Most Bibles have these maps of the missionary journeys, and you can see where he went on the first trip. They do not specify the locations on the second trip because the Bible doesn't specify those locations. It says he just went to the province, to that whole area. As you think of, as you read Galatians, think of these six questions that you should think of when you read almost anything. What, where, when, who, why, and how. And when you talk about when, of course, chronology comes into it, 
when you talk about where geography comes into it. So uh, the chronology and geography are very important in understanding the context of, of, uh, of what you read. Jesus Christ is mentioned 38 times in Galatians. So as you read through that, notice that, and you might want to write down what you're learning about Jesus from this text. Then, so in the next lecture, we will come back and start talking about chapter 1. God bless you.